Welcome to the new series of Life Stories with me, Des Tong. And where better to start with a legend, Jasper Carrot. Hi, Des. Welcome. Lovely to be here. You looking well? I'm all right. I'm all right for my age. Yep. <laughs> just been on holiday? Yes, just got back from Mallorca. I had a couple of weeks there and uh, we had uh, loads of friends out. And every night was party night. So uh, this is my holiday now. Right. And um, uh, it's important that you get rests in this business, as you know. Mm. Um, and we're very fortunate we have a place in Mallorca uh, and we can pop over any time. Okay, life stories. Let's go <sighs> right back to the beginning. Wow. Right back to the My beginning. My memory's not what it was, okay, we'll, <laughs> but we'll give it a go. I'll nudge you. Yeah. So, bought Robert Davis. Yes, in uh, a Cox Green, a Cox Shaft Green. Moor Lane. Right. I'm sure it was a brothel at some stage. <laughs> um, but yes, that's all, all my early years, uh, until I was about 19, were spent in a Cox Green. And I'm always proud of the fact I, was, I, uh, I live now 12 miles from where I was born. So I'm a Brummy born and bred, I love the city, uh, and I've always tried to promote it wherever I am. Um, and uh, so it's wonderful to be on, you know, Birmingham's own TV station. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And you went to uh, Mosley Grammar. I did, yes. Um, I, I, I had a choice. Uh, you, you have three choices, really, and I put Camp Hill grammar school first because everybody wanted to go there but I was never clever enough for that and then I had Mosley my second choice and Yardley my third and so I got Mosley but all my friends that I was with from Aycox Green Junior School they all put Yardley for their second choice so there was a big divide between myself and my friends um, but that was good because then I met lots of different people because Bev Bevan I was just gonna say, yeah. drummer in Electric Light Orchestra yeah. they sat us next together <laughs> on the very first day, right. and that was uh, nearly 60 years ago, and we've been friends ever since, and of course we're, 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 you know, we're working together after yeah. all these years. Yeah. Um, and uh, mostly was, um, I was never brilliant at all. You know, I, I, I ended up with two O levels, um, maths and art, and that was the first joke I ever wrote, because I got, got two O levels, maths and art. I was painting computers for about five years, <laughs> And that was, yeah, oh, blimey, well, it still gets a <laughs> yeah, laugh. Yeah, Thank you, does, Des. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so uh, mostly really did form, I suppose, my life to be. But you mm. don't realise it at the time. No, of course you don't. And Richard Tandy went there as well, didn't he? Richard it? Tandy. So there's like ELO, Beth Bevan, Richard yeah. Tandy. Yeah, two of the uh, Fortunes. I right. uh, can't remember the names. Right. Uh, but they were at Mosley. But I can't remember anybody else. When you were at school, did you have any inclination of like either music or comedy, was that? Well, I was, um, I was sort of involved with music because of Bev and uh, my other friends at Motor, who were in groups. I could never play an instrument, I certainly couldn't sing. Um, I, I, but I was involved on the fringe. The, the comedy, I don't know where the comedy came from. I always had a sort of uh, different sense of humour, if you like. I always remember the, the Smothers Brothers. Mm. They came and they, did, they were signed up to do 13 BBC One programmes. And they did two, and it was so bad, <laughs> they cancelled it. But I loved them. Yeah. I loved the Smothers Brothers. Yeah. Um, so I suppose, looking back, I had that, that, that odd that odd sense of humour, if you like. And I was, I was never the class clown, but I was always interested in comedy, right. like everybody else, you yeah. know, with Hancock and, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, the Pythons and, um, um, not the Pythons, um, the Goons, right. you know. Um, and then when I left school, I, was, I had a friend who had, who had like a mother who was probably the, the first hippie you know, and she was, um, she was bonkers, but lovely. And she had lots of records like, you know, blues stuff, but she had records by Tom Lehrer and Bill Cosby. Mm. And mm. that's really what got me into comedy. Right. Mm. Well, when you left school, you, yep. you uh, and I checked this out, uh, you worked at the Beehive. Yes. Department. department store in Albert Street. Right. It was the oldest department store in Birmingham. And I started with Bev. Yeah. And uh, without a doubt, without are you being served, I am convinced was based on the beehive. Right. Because we had all the characters, you know, the Mrs. Slocums yeah. and the, 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 the slightly gay, you know, guy yeah. in menswear. Yeah. We yeah. had all those. Yeah. And I'm convinced the guy must have worked at the beehive at some stage. What got you into the folk music then? Because I know you, you had um, that club, didn't you? The, the, the Boggery. 
Prior to that, uh, I used to go to some folk clubs in Birmingham, and I enjoyed folk clubs, particularly the light-hearted side. Mm. Um, and there was a big folk, uh, folk club at uh, Digbeth Civic Hall run by um, uh, Alex Campbell. Um, which is the father of, of, of the UB40. The UB40 yeah. guys, yeah. yeah. Uh, and other folk, and I used to go and I used to enjoy them. And then I had a stint at Butlins. Right. And uh, I, was, I, I had three months at Butlins and uh, I, I wasn't a red coat, I, I was a duffel coat actually, <laughs> uh, delivering stuff. And I started one night a week for the staff because there was not much for the staff to do. Yeah. And I sort of just ran it, it was only about 20 people. But when I came back, I got the, the idea that I would like to start a folk club. And I was living with a couple of guys, and the one guy uh, was an old Mosellean um, from Mosley Grammar, who was about five years older than me. And um, when I suggested this, he, he suggested the old Mosellean's right. in Solihull. Yeah. And he put up 50 pounds. This was 1969, mm. remember, uh, which is a lot of money then. Uh, is, and when that's gone, that'll be the end. So we started it. And it was really successful right from the off. You know, mm. we started with about 90 people. And within a, a month, we used to be getting 120, 130. The fire limit was 80. <laughs> so, but it was days that you didn't have, you know, health and safety. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I was with it for about five years. And it was really, really successful. And that's what got me into the business because I was comparing. Yeah. And when you're comparing, you can't talk about, you know, pestilence and disease and world misery. And so I used to do jokes. I used to go down to the Cresta Club in Solihull and yeah. nick all the jokes from, yeah. the, from the comedians and then do it on the Monday night, you know. And then I started to realize uh, when, I, when I was doing other folk clubs that everybody was telling the same jokes. So then I started to develop my own material. And I was very influenced by Tom Lehrer. Yeah. Uh, and uh, he played the piano and talked between songs. I played the guitar and talked between songs. And I built up a, a, a reputation. Because at, at that time as well, you got Billy Connolly was doing, mm. you know, the, going on the folk scene yep. and doing the thing. And I suppose even like Max Boyce. I never you know. knew Max Boyce. Uh, Billy Connolly, because I, I ran a folk agency, you know, right. to, to deal with folk music called Finger Me Gig. Finger Me Gig. That's yeah. right. And, uh, for three years, it was very successful in losing money. <laughs> and I used to bring Billy down from Scotland for, it was, it was a Midlands tour, okay, and he used to come down, good as gold. And on Saturday night, he was in Sutton Coalfield. On Sunday, he was in Plymouth. On Monday, he was back in Warsaw. Tuesday, he was up in Liverpool. Wednesday, he was over in Leicester. So this Midlands tour was a bit, you know, whatever. And I did it about three times. And right. he was very successful. Uh, and then he put his fee up to 50 pounds <laughs> and no one would pay it yeah. and uh, and then he had a bit of notoriety and they were going like can you get me Billy Connolly can you get me Billy Connolly and I went and I phoned up and uh, he was 5,000 pounds <laughs> 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 so the folk clubs didn't take him back mm. but uh, you know great time great yeah. time that's where I learnt my business of course DJM Records yes you, got, you then got a deal with DJM Records Dick James Music yeah. yes well, Billy had had a very successful uh, album out. Max Boyce, who had never met, um, but he was quite big in Wales, but because he had a massive album. So DJM, like most companies, were looking for a sort of an English Billy Connolly come Max Boyce. Mm. And DJM decided it was me. So um, I signed up to do an album for them. And they said to me, well, what we'll do is you can release a single and to see if it'll get some interest, you know, and get your name known a bit. And it was, that, that was it. Mm. And they gave me a thousand pounds to make this single, you see. So uh, I had this idea, um, and I was working with an American guy, and he had a song called Little Big Bike. And we changed it to Funky Moped. Yeah. So I made Funky Moped as a single. Um, and it cost 750 pounds. And with the other 250 pounds, I bought a Martin D28 12 string guitar. So, oh, everybody was happy <laughs> until the record company phoned up and said, what are you going to put on the B-side? Ah, um, right. And I thought, well, I've got no money. Um, but I'd made a private album and I'd got this track called Magic Roundabout. And um, so I put that on the B-side. Two DJs from Essex walked into DGM Records in London and bought a hundred copies each of Magic Roundabout. So DGM, sharp as a button, said, why? 
Now he said, because we play it, uh, when we go for a whiz at half time, for DJ, cup of coffee, we play Magic Roundabout. And it goes down and everybody laughs and everybody wants to buy a copy. Mm. So they bought 100 copies each and they, they doubled the price and sold it. DJM sent a copy of Magic Roundabout to all the DJs in the country, told them to play it, and it took off. And it is still the only ever hit single with no musical content, and yet it was a DJ disco hit. <laughs> Work it out, Des. I'm going to take a break there. All right. Welcome back to Life Stories with me, Des Tong, and my guest, Jasper Carrot. So, you're a, you're a pop star now. I was a pop star. Um, but of course, a hit single only gives you notoriety for about three or four months. Um, it, it established me in the Midlands, so yeah. I, I was doing a few uh, shows in the Midlands very successfully, thankfully. And I'd, I'd done a half an hour program for BBC Midlands called uh, An Evening Mislaid with Jasper Carrot, which was very well received. Um, and then I had a big break. Uh, I was doing my, uh, my show, when I say a one-man show, there was a support act, I'll come to that. Uh, and I was, I was working at the Royal Shakespeare Theatre in Stratford. This mm. was 1976. Right. Uh, and the support act was Victoria Wood. So you could see me and Victoria Wood for about £2.50. That's, nah, that's a bargain, dear. Yeah. Come yeah. on. So I was doing this show, and DJM... Um, had asked Michael Grade, who was then head of London Weekend Television, to come up and have a look to see whether, you know, he could do anything with this Midland comic. So he came up and he saw myself and uh, Victoria Wood. Uh, and, I, uh, and, and a few weeks ago, Michael Grade was on radio talking about Victoria Wood, and he mentioned this night, and he right. said, well, I went to see this unknown guy called Jasper Carrot. <laughs> he said, and, and I signed him up because I thought he'd got potential. He said, but don't ask me who the support was. <laughs> uh, it's funny you should say that, because Mike Alexander was on the other week. Yes. He, Shirley Bassey's musical director. Yeah. And he said, when he first worked with Victoria, he said to her, forget the music, concentrate on the comedy. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. And she had, I mean, she was only 22, 23, so mm. she was very raw around the ears, but mm. she, was, she obviously got potential. Yeah, you know? yeah. And so Michael Gray gave me um, the opportunity to do a, a pilot. And uh, it, at London Weekend in, in those days, that, well, they had more pilots than BA, to be honest. <laughs> and um, and I, had, I did this really, really naff half an hour. When I say naff, it, the setting was like, it was like tins. It was like a really second-rate working man's club setting, you know. Yeah. Um, but I did a half an hour. Was that the audience with? An audience with, yes. Yeah. And uh, that was my title, which they nicked yeah. later on. Uh, and I did, uh, I did half an hour. And uh, the idea was to do three half hours. Um, but after I'd done the, the opening one, he came and he said, can you do six? He said, and if you do six, I might be able to get it on the network. And that's what I did. So I did six half hours. And in those days, of course, independent television was, it was all, all, the, all the people like, you know, Granada, Time Tees, yeah, yeah. ATV, uh, whatever. And they were all responsible for their own output after 10 o'clock. So I went out on uh, London Weekend and... Uh, uh, were, you doing, were you doing Birmingham-based comedy on London Weekend? Yeah, but it, it was nothing to do with Birmingham. All my early stuff, I only ever worked Birmingham three times in my early six right. years, oh, right. yeah, because right. I, I, it was yeah. it was profit in your own land. Yeah. I was far more popular in Liverpool, Hull, Portsmouth, you know, um, and so the material really wasn't to do with it was. I did talk about Birmingham, but mm. it was talking about Birmingham to who pe from to people who didn't know Birmingham. Right. right. So I did half an hour, and I did um, you know, and I did whatever it was, but it was very successful. So he gave me these six, and it took twelve months for my series, An Audience with Jasper Carrot, to go round the country, which was fantastic because whenever it went out, I used to book the theatres to coincide with, you know, yes, yes. post, post uh, the, yeah. the, the show. Yeah. And I did about 125 shows, very, 125 concerts all over the country, 124 sellouts. And what, there was one that didn't sell out, which was Burnley. <laughs> because I thought Burnley was in Yorkshire. <laughs> yeah. And so, so we put on, because nobody in Burnley knew who the hell I was, except for about 40 folkies, you know. Yeah. But the, a load of people, about 300 people, came over from Yorkshire to see the show. 
Um, and that's really uh, when everything started to take off. Yeah. That's when you know I became sort of like nationally known. Um, and uh, in those early days, 78, 79, 80, it was massive, mm. absolutely massive. Mm. Uh, I mean, I, I, I couldn't do the big 10,000, 15,000 seaters because one, not many were around, and two, there wasn't the technology yeah, to yeah. get the screens up. That's you know? right, that's right. Um, but, it, um, and, and that was, re that kicked it all off. And then I did a, an hour's, I did an hour's live from Drury Lane yeah. on a Sunday night, live to air on ITV, because uh, there's only three channels then, and it got about uh, 10 or 11 million viewers. And it is still the only ever one hour live to air stand up comedy show. How did so, that feel? Um, it was scary. It was scary. A bit like me reading the news. <laughs> like, as you said. <laughs> but I was all right. I was confident because the material was good. But it was all, it was all live. And, and I, was, I was about 10 minutes in, and there was lots of giggles coming from the front row. And I couldn't. And I, and I realized my flies were under. <laughs> I, I, honestly, I know, I know it sounds terrible, but it's on live television, ten, 10 million people, and so I got the guitar over, over my crotch. Yeah. So they, because like, and I mean, I shouldn't have done it really, because like, you know, television puts 10 pounds on, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, I had to hide. <laughs> we always had this saying in, in music, like if, um, if a guitar player ever had to go to the front and sing, it was like glass trousers. Because, you know, if you take your guitar away, you can always see. You know, <laughs> All right, I'll set so, up the class So you, you changed then. You went from there. You, then you went to BBC, didn't you? Yes. I, um, I, I, uh, they were looking for someone to front a Saturday night show. And they'd approached Dave Allen, who, of course, was a very big name. And he'd turned it down. And a bloke called Jim Moyer came up from the BBC to see me and said, would you like to do a Saturday night show? At that stage, there was no format, or, you know, but he said he would like it topical. Mm. So I met a guy called Neil Shand, who was a uh, head writer for um, lots of different people. He'd been on, that was the week that was, Spike Milligan. Mm. And so I was talking through a show with Neil Shand. And while we were talking, Jim Moore came in and he said, um, Dave Allen's turned it down. Um, would you like to do the Saturday night show? And so we then conceived a 40-minute show that was live to air, that would feature, basically it was, that was the week that was, but with, a, with much more of, a, obviously, a, a yeah. modern update, but much more concentrating on a central figure, which is me, plus all the sketches and whatever. And that was very successful. I did two years of that, won a BAFTA. Should have done a third series. Should have done, but didn't do it. Was that where the detectives came in? No. No. From, from uh, Carrot's Lib, which that, those two series are called, um, I then went on, I did another hour special from uh, the Palladium, and then um, um, I've got to keep track here. Then I, did a, I, I went to America and some, did some work out there and came back, and then I did another series called Carrot Confidential, Confidential. which was pretty much the same as Carrot's Lib, but again with, 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 with variations. Um, and then uh, after that came um, uh, a show that I did called uh, Carrot's Commercial Breakdown, yeah. which was showing adverts from all over the world that were yeah. funny and quite rude and stuff. And that was very successful um, and got a, a, a gold medal from New York and a, a silver from uh, Montreux. And that's where I met and introduced to the business Steve Knight. Yeah. He of Peaky Blinders fame, yes. Mike Whitehill, they became my main writers for about seven years. And Steve, in 1989, 25 years ago, was talking about this Peaky Blinders thing he'd got in his head. Hmm. And eventually he did it after 25 years. Yeah. And of course, to great success. But he was my main writer along with uh, Mike Whitehill. Uh, and we did uh, Commercial Breakdown, um, and then we did Canned Carrot, mm. which was, again, six half hours. I did two series of that. And in that was featured The Detectives. So how did you get Robert Powell and George Sewell <laughs> into comedy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it, um, it was one of those supercilious moments in my life. I was, I was looking at The Detectives, and we were talking about it with Steve and, and Mike. And, and I loved it. It was in a five-minute format then, mm. and I loved it. And I said, who do you see as the other detective? And they said, oh, 
We don't want another comedian. No, no. We want, we want an actor, you know, like a, a serious actor. You know, I said, well, who? That and, and they just said off the top of their heads, thinking that there's no way in God's earth he's ever going to agree to it. They went, you know, someone like you know, Robert Powell. You're talking about Jesus Christ. <laughs> and it was very super serious because I went, what? You want Robert Powell? And they went, well, he'd never do it. Robert, Jasper. <laughs> They absolutely fell out the chairs. And what they didn't know, Robert and I were very close friends, and we'd always talked about working together. And I said, Robert, we have to talk like that to Robert, you see. I said, I've got a script, you know, I think I, I'll send them down to you, see what you think about it. And so that's how it happened. So he, the first thing he did, he rang me back, and they were five minute vignettes. And the first thing he said was, this could be a series. And of course, it was. Yeah. And it was um, one of the most enjoyable periods of my entire career. He is a terrific guy, mm. terrific guy. I mean, like blood brothers, you know, and we had so much fun. The uh, end of shoot parties, Des, uh, are yeah. notorious, <laughs> legendary. <laughs> I'm going to stop you there, Jasper. Okay. If you'd like to see some more of this, then tune in next week because we're going to have part two of Life Stories with Jasper Carrot.